thinking about the communion meditation this morning, and and uh, I was thinking about when when Jesus met in the upper room. He made had had to make sure that they that the disciples had got the room taken care of and everything was going on, and a lot of things went on. They took they had the the, the Passover supper, and Jesus instituted the Lord's supper. And I was reading in John the thirteenth chapter, and. Uh, it says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Just those, that scripture right there talks about Christ knew the end was coming. Remember, he'd been talking about it long before that. And the next thing Jesus did was wash, the people, wash his disciples' feet. And you know the story. Some of them didn't like to didn't want him to do that. But he said that had to be done because he was trying to show that he was a servant. He was, he was our suffering servant. And so he instituted, after that, he instituted the Lord's Supper. And then he was still sorrowful. And then after they get done, they pray. And then it says that he goes out to the Mount of Olives. And he came out and went, was, was it, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. Where, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to a place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. An angel be done. Your an and an angel came to them and from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, it says, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. You know, we have no idea what Jesus went through those hours. But he knew this is what he came for. And so as we gather around this table to remember that, I want us to think about the suffering Jesus went through, the, the pain he had, because he said, if it's, if it's possible, take this away from me. But he said, not my will, but thine be done. And so as we gather around this table and remember what Jesus did for us, and, and like I said, he'd already instituted the Lord's Supper. And, and so this time he, he, we have to, to meditate. And in the past, we've always had the elder or the deacons coming out and, and passing around. Now we want you to pick it up as you come in. And we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to pray here in just a moment. And then uh, Karen's going to play us a song. Gives us time to meditate. You know, when we were passing out before, we had time to meditate. But I want us to really think about what Christ did for us. It's a time of, of sorrow for him. It should be gladness for us, and it is. And we celebrate this time of the year with Christ's birth, but we need to be remembering what he did for us. And and I and I and I hope we can do this. And following uh, her um, Karen's song, I'm going to come back up, and we're all going to partake in unison. And I hopefully this will be something will be maybe a new norm. If you want to have a new norm, we're going to try to do it together. Jesus and his disciples took it together. Let's take it together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to come around your table. We're thankful, Father, that you loved us enough that you sent your Son to die for us that we might have eternal life. And as we gather around this table to remember what he did for us, help us never to forget because he loved us so much. Guide us and direct us as we partake these emblems. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
get your little cups and things apart. That's kind of hard sometimes. He was in the upper room as Jesus took the bread, blessed it and break it, and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. After supper, he took the cup, drew the vine, and said, This is my blood, which is shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. Thank you very much. Good morning. Oh, it is so good to be here. And as we were just talking about a new normal, uh, we've been talking with the elders and deacons and actually we're focusing more on a biblical normal, and we're trying to get back to the way the Bible has it. And one of those things is we did want to start having kids worship again in kids' classes. So right now, uh, if you want to, if you are in preschool through fifth grade, you can head on back that way. Uh, Jesse is taking all the kids to class today, so they will be going and diving in to the Bible on their level, um, being able to get a little deeper in that way. So I encourage you to head on there. Right now, before we begin, I do want to pray, but we've, we've talked about how a lot of times we come in and we've all been giving our offering, and we've all been laying it in the plate. But I think it's important for us to not just give it, but it's about our heart in giving. So today we're going to pray and just thank the Lord for what he's given us. And as I pray, I want you to sit there and as you pray, to yourselves or pray by yourselves to God, what I want you to do is talk to God and tell him why you're thankful and tell him why you're giving today. Why is it you are giving of your offerings today? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come right now to thank you. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you as we have partaken around the table of the bread and the juice that represented your body and your blood, the sacrifice you made. We thank you for all of that, Lord, and all that you gave. And Lord, we come with our offerings today, lifting them up in our way of worshiping you and giving back. Because you have given us everything. We were born in this world with nothing, and now we want to give back and say thank you for what you've given us, Lord. We show our appreciation and our love through our offering today. Thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another big thing, another announcement that I want to throw out there really quick is we are heading towards a new biblical normal like we had said, but some of it will be a little similar. We are going to be starting back Sunday school class on January 3rd. So right as we begin, we'll start Sunday school class, and we'll do that at 9 o'clock. So you all who were here at 9 o'clock today, you can make it. So join us for Sunday school at 9 a.m. January 3rd. But when we get into Sunday school, we are going to do it a little bit different. We feel like we need to be getting back to the family aspect and being together as a church family. So we are going to do one giant Sunday school class in here to begin with. That's what we're going to start with. So we encourage you. Join us for that, and it will be an elder up here teaching. It will not be me. You don't have to sit through me for two or three hours. There will be an elder up here teaching. So I encourage you, come out for that um, and join us as we start the new year, diving personally in Bible study and then coming together and worshiping God and looking at what his message is for us. This weekend... My family and I, as well as many of you as I find out, got to participate in the Covington Polar Express light experience. It was great to have the whole family. We dressed up in our Christmas pajamas, and we were all going around with Christmas hats and driving around and looking at all the Christmas lights while sipping on hot chocolate and trying to decide who in Covington has the best Christmas lights. But the cool part was, is as we got going, we started looking and we had Christmas music playing. No longer were we looking for the best Christmas lights. 
I heard my kids in the back and my wife continue to say, oh, this is so magical. Looking at all the lights and as we pull up to one house that is just dancing Christmas trees and all the, you know, the Delps house. Everybody knows the Delps house. Just boom. Whoa. You get excited and everyone goes, oh, I'm so excited. This is so cool. Oh, I know this song. Oh, yes. And everyone is just so excited for what is happening as the lights go on around you. Doesn't Christmas lights just seem to heighten the excitement of Christmas? I don't know what it is, but as soon as the electricity begins to flow through this little bulb, and I will tell you, we have lights in here, but I don't walk in and look at the lights in on Sunday mornings and go, yippee, I'm so excited because of the lights this morning. But as soon as that little Christmas light turns on, whoa, this is so cool. The excitement, the atmosphere just changes. And the funny thing is, it's not just kids. Even adults seem to light up and become very excited and almost begin to act like kids again. I know in our car, it wasn't my kids going, look, there's the Mickey Mouse light up. Oh, look over there. That's Santa Claus. Oh, look, there's the Grinch. That's what was me and my wife. My son, though, he was sitting there and he goes, oh, baby Jesus. Oh, look, it's baby Jesus. Every time we would go by an activity, he got excited for the baby Jesus. You see, the atmosphere surrounding Christmas just seems to keep building the excitement until the moment everyone is waiting for, and we get to that moment, and that is opening the presents on Christmas morning. And we get there, and we open the presents, and what happens the day after? Oh, but now we got to clean up all this stuff. And as a parent, you go, where are we storing all of these toys? As a grandparent, you go, yes, you have to store all of these toys. But the excitement goes away. You see, the first Christmas, the birth of Jesus, there was so much excitement going on. There was more excitement than I think even happens today as it built through the first night of Christmas, through the birth of Christ. In Luke 2, we see that this excitement continues to build all the way up to the point of receiving the greatest gift we could ever receive. But unlike many of our Christmases, it doesn't just stop after they receive the presents. The excitement keeps going, and it looks different than most of our excitement for Christmas looks today. Today, we're going to look at this Luke account and see three different things that connected the excitement in the Christmas story to the people in this story. Stand with me as we read Luke 2, 4 through 15. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. You may be seated. As we read this, can't you just feel the excitement? Can't you just feel the shepherd sitting there 
Imagine being one of those shepherds, sitting out in the field, doing your regular job, just minding your business, when all of a sudden, as it says in verse 9, an angel of the Lord appears and the glory of the Lord shone around them. We're not talking me coming up on the stage and just going, hi, everyone. Or if I wanted to be really spectacular, I could jump out from behind the curtain. Boom. It's not that. This is literally in the sky out of nowhere, an angel, a being that would be so spectacular to see that they had never seen anything like it before. And then on top of that, it says the glory of the Lord shone around him. So now we're talking bright, glorious light shining all around. This is bigger than the Delps bar or Delps house, okay? We're talking just glory. Could you imagine? Well, let's be honest. The first thing the shepherds feel is an excitement. And if we saw that, even if we went to the Delps house and there were no lights, no nothing, and then all of a sudden, boom, bright light shining, how many of you would be terrified? I know I would. Just like the shepherds were, they were terrified because if a bright light shines and there's one person standing at the end of the light, what's the first thing you're thinking? Don't walk into the light, right? Stay away from the light. No, this, this I'm, I'm dead. <laughs> this is it. That is probably what they could have been thinking, or I'm about to die. But the angel then begins to talk and quickly says, do not fear. I've got a, I've got a message for you. I've got good news. And then in verse 13, you get to where suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God. The excitement factor is definitely starting to sink in for these shepherds. Not only is the one angel visited with bright lights of glory with good news, but then the sky is full of a choir of angels singing praises to God. This would have been the ultimate choir concert. Some of you have had to go to choir concerts at schools for your kids or for your grandkids, and some of them are really good. And you go, oh, that was really cool. That was really good. But imagine if all of a sudden at the concert they had lights going and the lights are flashing, and boom, 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 and the kids are singing and one kid comes out and sings, and it's like out of a movie. How many of us have seen any of the movies with choirs, even kids' choirs, and go, yeah, that's nothing like that? There's no way. I've been to all my kids' choirs. They're good and all, but there's no choir concert at a kid's school that's ever like anything in the movies. Well, that's what this is like even better. I don't know about you, but for me, pageantry and atmosphere that is built just gets me excited. Like even talking about it, I get excited about what was happening for the shepherds, seeing this light, seeing all of this greatness and hearing these angelic voices. It reminds me a little bit of going to a concert. You come in and the one person comes out and they say, are you ready to rock? And they get excited and it's really loud and the music gets going and it's passionate and the lights are bright and flashing and it's just, yes. And, you're, and I know some of you now, your concerts are not quite like that. But think back into the 60s and some of you into the 40s. The concerts were, imagine concerts like that. Everyone cheering and united together as you're standing there in that moment of pure awesomeness, feeling the excitement. And it's just, yes, this is so great. Sometimes, I think today as Christians, we may get caught up in the atmosphere. We may get caught up in the music, the atmosphere even the music brings. You see, our excitement during the Christmas season, during Sunday morning service, or any time we're together worshiping our Lord, shouldn't come solely from the atmosphere. We shouldn't leave church saying, man, I was really moved by just this song. Man, the worship songs, they just really... They get me. I love the music. It's not all about the music. Because you see, when you make it about the atmosphere, when you make it about, and some of you may get very excited around Christmas. I do. I get extremely excited around Christmas. 
But when your excitement is just built around the atmosphere of Christmas, what happens when Christmas leaves? When December is gone and January comes, what happens? You lose the excitement. And actually, there's a, there's a medical term out there that is actually the New Year's depression. And some have said it's due to the fact that people get so excited for Christmas that when New Year's come and that excitement factor disappears, they have nothing to live for. Their excitement and everything they had been excited about is gone. It's the same thing. When you go to a concert after the music ends and everyone goes home, what are you left with the next day? Usually a headache and a, 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 a hoarse voice. The experience in the environment was cool, but if that's all you're excited for, then the excitement will only last for the moment that you're in the atmosphere. If you sit in the service or listen to a worship song or you get caught up in the music and go, I'm on fire for Jesus because of this song, because of what's going on. And you say, this music, it just, it just wakes me up. It just does it for me. I think you're missing the point. Because oftentimes when you go home or turn off the song and the next day you're back to living the way you were before. And your excitement for Christ starts to disappear. Because it's all about the atmosphere. You see, worship isn't about how the song makes you feel or how the lights or atmosphere makes you feel. The first Christmas story isn't about the angels, no matter how much Dolly Parton wants to make it about the angels. First Christmas story isn't about the choir concert that only the shepherds got to hear. That's not what the emphasis is on. All of those things are just, they're important. I'm not saying worship isn't important. But what I'm saying is all those things are just a tool so that we can hear the exciting news that is found in the message presented by those things. See, in verses 10 through 14, you can hear what the shepherds were really excited about and what should even excite us today said, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will, not, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. See, first, the angel comes and says, in this great message, he says, that hope promised by God to the nation of Israel, to the Jews, about a Messiah who would come and rule. Spoken by the Old Testament prophets that they have all been waiting for. For over 400 years plus, the Lord has answered their prayers. The Lord has responded to their prayers and brought the hope that they had hoped for as the Jewish people. Not only has the Messiah come, not only is this great king that they've been praying about come, but he comes to save them. They're all going to be saved. At this moment, they all believed that they would be saved from Romans and be on their own nation again. They believe that Jesus is supposed to come as the Messiah to come in and conquer the Romans and rise up. And the Israel of nation will be the greatest nation that ever was, ever is, and ever will be. But we all know that that isn't what God had in mind, right? Instead, this is where the excitement comes for us. Christ came to save us from our sins. He said, I don't want to just make Israel a great nation here on earth. I want to make Israel a great nation for eternity. I want to save you from your sins so you have no fear of where you are going. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16 tells us, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world 
to save sinners. I don't know about you, but I'm lucky that that's what he came to do because I am a huge sinner. As Paul says, of whom I am the utmost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Christ has come to save us from death because of our sins. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that something to get excited about? That we know the penalty to death or the penalty to sins is death in hell. We know that that's what's coming if you've sinned. Can anyone in this room tell me they've never done anything wrong? Even tell your wife that she looked good in a dress when she really didn't and you lied to her. Yeah, that's even a sin there. It's a sin that some of us go, well, I'm glad I said it. But it's still a sin. That should bring us excitement alone, and that should get us excited that this is what Christ came to do. But it doesn't stop there. In verse 14 of Luke 2, the choir of angels say that God's peace has finally come to earth. Not only did Christ come to save, but he also came to bring true peace. And unlike the Israelites who think peace means no longer will there be wars, we aren't just talking peace among nations. We're talking peace in your hearts. You will be at peace with yourself and with God. You will no longer have to struggle inwardly with right and wrong. Instead, Christ said, I have come and I have brought you a mighty counselor who will be there to help you. I have given you the Holy Spirit that when you sit there and go, is this right or wrong? Ask him and he will show you. Listen to the Holy Spirit and you won't have to battle anymore. You won't be at battle inside of yourself if you listen to the Holy Spirit. Christ says, that's what I've come to do. Come to let you be free from slavery to sin. I have come so that you can live in righteousness. Who here brings excitement when you hear that? You don't have to have anxiety anymore. You, Christ came so that you could be anxiety-free, stress-free, that you don't have to sit there and hate yourself. Christ came so that you can have peace because he saved you. And then he goes a little further and the angels say in verse 10, when he starts off, he says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. He doesn't say for all the Jewish people. He says all the people. Christ has come to save everyone. He came to save the rich, the poor, the good, the bad, the philanthropist, the Scrooge. He came to save the people that save lives, and he came to save the people who take lives. Christ came to save everyone. As long as they will hear the message and put it into action through faith. That put it into action through faith is a big one. Because you see, after hearing this exciting news, the first things that the shepherds did in verse 15, they said, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said unto one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. You see, they wanted to see and experience firsthand the good news that they had just heard. They had been told this, and here is the faith aspect of this. You ready? The shepherds go and leave. When it says go and leave, that means they're leaving behind their sheep to go into the shepherds or to go and see Jesus. They could lose a lot of money if someone decided to come and steal. If a wolf decided there's no one here, let's feast. They could lose a lot of money, but they heard such great, exciting news that they said, losing money 
getting in trouble, all of that is worth it if what is said here is true. If we can truly see the Messiah, this is worth it. That's true faith, if you ask me. They put it in action. They heard, this is something great. If you want it, go get it. Now, let me ask you a question. If they didn't go and check it out, how many of us would think they were crazy? How many of us would sit there and go, stupid shepherds. You had the chance to see the Messiah, to see this exciting news. And all you did was sit there. All you did was say, oh, that's cool. Thanks, angels. Wouldn't we think that's pretty crazy? But now let's bring it to today. There are some people who have heard the message of Christ. They've heard of his love and the passion for them but they still won't accept it and experience it for themselves. That sounds crazy to me. If you know what Christ is offering, you've heard this exciting news, what is holding you back? What is keeping you from saying, I want to follow Christ, I want to have Christ in my life, I want to experience that love? You've heard elders, deacons, men of this church get up here Several of you have heard missionaries come in and talk about what Christ has done. You have heard me. You have heard many ministers before me come up here and talk about what Christ has done in their life and told you how amazing Christ is. If you haven't acted on it yet, why not? What's keeping you from letting Christ come into your life? You have that chance. Later today, we're going to give an opportunity to come up. I want to ask you now. Start thinking about that. Ask yourself, if you have not accepted Christ yet, if you have not let him in your life, if you're not experiencing this joy and peace that Christ offers, why not? Why not today? And now for a lot of you that have, I come to you. Once you've heard the news, we need to take the lead from the shepherds in verses 16 through 17. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what he had been, what they had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. You see, we are called in our excitement of what Christ has done in our lives to share with others what God has done. And you notice I didn't just say share the good news of Christ. But we are called to talk about Christ's effect in our lives. How the good news of Christ has saved us and how we have found true peace and joy in Jesus. It's one thing to go to someone and say, Jesus loves you. You should be saved. If you don't, you're going to hell. It's bad. It's another thing to approach someone and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me, and let me tell you how much Jesus loves you. This is what Christ has done in my life. Not only did he die for me, but when I was in a low point, and I will tell you, me personally, I was in a very low point. I was at a point where I was struggling with sin. I was, it looked like I was doing really good, but I was struggling with sin, anxiety, a little bit of depression, and I had all this going on in my life. No one else knew about it. Accept Christ. And when I decided that I was done trying to do it on my own and I gave it over to Christ and I let Christ into my life and I said, Christ, I, I want to follow you. I believe in you. Not only do I believe that you died, not only do I believe that you were real, but I believe that you can bring joy to my life. As soon as I did that, that's when it all changed. I all of a sudden wasn't at war with myself. I gave stuff over to Christ. And when stuff bad was happening, I wasn't sitting there going, oh, should I do it? Should I not do it? If I did wrong, I said, I'm sorry, I give it to you. I'm at peace. I give it. I know you have forgiven me. I give this over to you, Lord. But I want to say none of this joy that I have, I have peace. I will tell you, I have had COVID. I did not worry a day that I had COVID or a second that I had COVID because I knew no matter what happened, even if I died, I knew where I was going and I knew who had me in his hands. 
no matter what happened. Because I've got that peace and joy of Christ. I want to say, if you don't have that, you can. And if you do have that, are you telling others? Because here's the reason why it's so important to spread the good news of Christ and what he's done in your life. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. I want to ask you a question. Do you have beautiful feet? I know that sounds weird. But are you going out and spreading the good news? Christ has sent us. He has sent us. Are you going out? I'll tell you, there was a video put out a couple years ago by a name by a man named Pin Gillette. Pin first rose to fame as half of the magic duo of Pin and Teller. Pin is the big guy that talks. He's also well known as a passionate advocate for atheism, among many other things. And a few years ago, Gillette recorded a video about someone who came to him after one of his magic shows. He said the guy was about his age and had participated in one of the acts as an audience member. The man complimented Gillette on the show and said, I brought this for you. The man held up a small book. It was a New Testament with the Psalms, something that could fit in a person's pocket. I wrote in front of it, the man said. And I wanted you to have this. The man explained he was a businessman and was not crazy. He wasn't a preacher. He was just a normal businessman. Gillette, moved by the man's gesture, recalled, he was kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me, then gave me this Bible. I've always said, Gillette explained, I don't respect people who do not proselytize or do not evangelize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there is a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make things socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them? Gillette then offered this example to illustrate his point. If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point that I tackle you. And this is more important than that. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite, honest, and sane. He cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a Bible. I still think religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man... That was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. And that's how the video ends. From the words of an atheist, a strong atheist. If we as Christians sit here every Sunday and talk about how great Jesus' love in our lives is and how much we love others and how much we want to spread God's word, then prove it. Let's quit worrying so much about what others may think Let's quit worrying about, well, it may cost me my job, it may cost me friends, it may cost me my social status. What did it cost Christ when he came to show you love? It cost him his social status, it cost him some friends, it cost him his life. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know if they don't know about Christ and how he is saved, and changed us. And he can do the same for them. If they will believe, repent, and in faith be baptized. If that doesn't happen, we know where they're going. They're going to hell. I know we don't like to talk about it. But it's true. So I say let's take the excitement we have this Christmas season. Let's take the excitement that we have about what Christ has done in our lives. And let's be like the shepherds and let us go out and tell everybody. 
Let's go with excitement and say, let me tell you what Christ has done in my life. Let me tell you what Christ has done for you. Who cares what they think? If they say you're a lunatic, at least they know. Because what did they call Jesus? A lunatic, some of them. Some of them thought he was crazy, but did he stop? No. Did his apostles stop? No. They went into places where they would even get stoned. They would get killed if they set up and went to talk. Paul even went and purposely got arrested so that he could go to Rome, to the emperor, to Caesar, to tell Caesar about Christ. And what Christ had done in his life. I don't know about you, but how many of us would be willing for Jesus to get arrested and thrown in prison so that we could go and talk to someone specifically? We should. You see, Mark 16, 15 through 16, Jesus said this. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to all creation to everybody whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned it is on us to tell them so they can be saved and i want to come back to those of you that maybe have not experienced that joy yet if you're just now realizing the excitement of this message of christ and you want to step up and follow him, today is the day. I encourage you, come up here and see and experience what excitement you have heard about today. In a second, I'm going to pray. The praise band's going to come up. We're going to sing a song. What I want to encourage you is, the elders and I are going to be up here to not only talk, but we're ready for you to put your excitement of what you're hearing into action for you to start following Christ. And I want to say this after we pray, even while I'm praying, if you feel the call, come on up. You don't have to wait till the music starts. I encourage you come up. We have elders here. We have myself. I've even got a, a, a retired minister up here who would love to talk to you. We've got several of us here. Come forward today. This is your chance. To see what God has promised today. You've heard the message. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come now thanking you as we are excited about what Christ coming means for us. What Christ coming means for the world. You are so good. Thank you for this exciting news. And the fact that it's not just news that we just listen to and go, that's awesome. We can put it into action. Lord, there are many of us today who have already put that faith into action and heard the news and said, I want to follow Jesus. But those that have not, Lord, I pray you open their ears and their hearts and that today is the day that they step forward and say, I'm ready. Lord, and I pray that they, when they step forward, that those of us here at this church come around them and say, we're going to walk with you in your faith. We're going to be there with you. But I also pray, Lord, for those who have not heard your or who have heard your word, who have followed you. Lord, if we're not putting into action of going and spreading this good news that you have given us and that you have displayed in our lives that we have seen firsthand. If we're not going around telling others about that. Convict us. Lord, I pray conviction on anyone who is not doing that. And in the conviction that we go and do what you have called us to do. To go and preach to all creation. Let the world know why Christmas is so important. Not just because of the birth of Christ. But because of the life, the death, the resurrection, and the hope of eternal life in Christ. Give us the boldness. Let our excitement never run out, Lord, because you continue to do amazing things.
Jesus' name I pray.